All right, so we're going to go ahead and start. That's us. Yeah. Um, you guys introduce yourselves? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Miriam Perez. I'm a blogger and online communications consultant. You'll hear more from me in a few minutes. Welcome. Hi, I'm Jamia Wilson, and I'm a feminist media activist, and I work at Women's Media Center. And my name is Beth Pepper. I'm a uh, social media consultant with campaigns and legislative offices and, and uh, unions, and I work for progressivecommons.org doing online communication and um, inside-outside strategy. So thank you so much for getting up early this morning to come and join us and talk about hurting bloggers for your cause. Um, but I think in terms of the semantics, I don't necessarily want to call it hurting and more <laughs> so <laughs> um, think of it as an opportunity to convene with people to organize. And it's just like any of the other, or other organizing we're doing. It's, it's about relationship building. So I wanted to say that I'm really grateful to be here today with all of you and talk a little bit about blogger outreach from a nonprofit perspective. And then our other wonderful panelists will talk more from their purviews. But I'll talk about my experience working from a nonprofit organization who does administrative nonprofit work in addition to actually being a media outlet. So we're an activist organization that also puts out original content and we're also a media outlet that people pitch and also produce original content. So it's interesting because we, we do both and we're in both of those worlds. So I, before I get into the pieces that I want to talk about, which are about reciprocity, being a helpful resource, and then also building and cultivating relationships, I'll just tell you a little bit about Women's Media Center in case you don't know us already. And then you'll love us after you hear about us. But uh, we were founded in 2005 by Jane Fonda, Gloria Steinem, and Robin Morgan to address the issue of the lack of representation of women and girls in the media, lack of equal representation. And the organization was founded to amplify women's voices to change the conversation in the media and also change the face of the media so that you are not just hearing half the story, that you're hearing the whole story and that the history books will actually reflect the reality of all of our story, which includes women and girls and trans folks as well. And so the first part that I wanted to talk about was that like I said, we have this interesting dynamic where we are a media org as well as a nonprofit that does trainings and we organize and do sex, anti-sexism campaigns and media accountability campaigns. So we're working within and without of the media all the time and it's a really interesting identity crisis and opportunity for us and creates interesting opportunities in terms of cultivating blogging relationships. So. We work in solidarity with many bloggers because we blog ourselves but also have lots of bloggers who graduate from our programs and also work with us in a myriad of ways that I'll discuss in a second. And many of the bloggers that we work with are really eager to partner with us because a lot of the bloggers we work with are feminist bloggers or feminist allies who understand the issue of the lack of parity within the media and it impacts their daily lives. So that's really helpful for us in terms of galvanizing people who want to be a part of, of what we're doing and people who understand that it's important for us all to work together so that women and girls can be a part of deciding who gets to shape the debate and, and what the story is. So first thing is reciprocity that I want to talk about. Um, we I feel that it's important to give if you want to receive. Uh, it's about the karmic flow. I'm new agey and I bring that to my work every day, so I'll bring that out here. That's how I look at the, the blogger cultivation and organizing in general. People like it when you give them stuff and there's this kind of energetic thing that happens when, when you give and you receive and the back and forth and we all play it, pay it forward. And so I think that that's something we do in real time every day. So like I said, we curate original content. We have features that we put out that are stories that are often invisible stories or stories that don't get enough attention in the mainstream. And so we give bloggers, mainly women bloggers, but sometimes we have men who are feminist allies who are writing on issues pertaining to women and girls. Opportunities to receive paid honoraria, modest paid honoraria, not gonna lie, to submit their pieces. But the good part about that is that we do believe in paying people for their good work. And so that's one way that we cultivate relationships with bloggers because we say, you know, unlike some other people who shall remain nameless, we do pay you for your blogging. And this is because we believe in you and we hope to be able to pay more at some point. 
but that's one way that we cultivate relationships because bloggers really do appreciate that and often approach us with pitches. I mean, it's a very modest amount that we give people to, to write these amazing pieces that are often longer form pieces as well. But we get a lot of people who are interested because they see that we believe in investing in them and even that small amount that we're able to pay goes a long way. Also, we have a database called SheSource, which is a database of over 500 women experts. And I'm working to expand the da database also to have girls be a part of that as well. And this database gives bloggers access within a click to sources for their stories and pieces. But we also feature bloggers who have specific expertise that other bookers and producers and members of the media may be interested in featuring. So anytime any member comes to us saying, you know, I need an aerodynamic engineer who can talk about environmental justice from a women's perspective, we can find that person for them, or probably three. And if someone's blogging on that, we can find that blogger too. And so it's helpful for us to be able to give blogger sources when they need them, but also to feature their work and feature them as experts because the media really like to talk to bloggers and other journalists because they see them as credible sources. They believe in that journalistic integrity and standards, and there's an assumption of being peers here, and that that's a really helpful thing too to offer bloggers an opportunity to help promote their platform. And then finally on that piece, we have a tweet up called She Party, which began as a response to Tea Party, but it's really a Twitter happy hour that happens every Wednesday from 3 to 5 where we talk about the news of the day, the news of the week as it pertains to women and girls and media, uh, feminist media activism. And we have many bloggers who participate in this discussion and social media influencers. And it's a great opportunity for us also to promote great blogs that came out that week on the issues that pertain to our, to our cause. And so it's a really great place for us to feature bloggers' work as well as that, like I said, that karmic flow then to be highlighted. Sometimes we invite them to be guest tweeters and we will promote them as our guest tweeters to bring people in to talk with them and ask them questions. And it's a great opportunity to pay it forward. And so gathering bloggers is about organic and authentic relationships and really building healthy relationships just like you would in any other space. And so Deanna Zant, I know that many people heard from her already who has written a book called Share This. It's a social media book. Um, is a graduate of our Progressive Women's Voices training program, and we're big fans of her. I call her my personal social media guru, and she has a theory that social media is about creating an ecosystem that's like a cocktail party. So just like if you go to a cocktail party and you meet that person who only talks about themselves and only egregiously self-promotes but doesn't want to hear about you or your life and what you do, you probably don't want to really engage with that person or you don't want to um, partner with them on anything. It's the same way with blogging relationships and social media building as well. And I think it's a really perfect example to think about the way that this work should be done most effectively. And so, like I said, it's crucial to give back. It's not important for us just to ask people to push our stuff out. We really need bloggers to help spread the word. That's a big part of the changing media landscape. And they're oftentimes the revolution is very underfunded, um, extremely underfunded. And so because bloggers need resources to survive and not just survive but thrive, it's key for us to find ways that us and our organizations and affiliations can help them thrive. And we all have small budgets, but there's other creative ways that we can think about doing that too if we can't monetarily compensate people. So one of the ways we do that is we work with bloggers as media partners for different events that we're having. We give them special access to panelists and speakers for interviews, exclusives. We also publish guest posts and link back to them when appropriate, when it pertains to our issues. And we will also, because we are a media org ourselves, we'll live tweet and, and go and live blog at other people's events as well. And so just finally, I want to mention a couple of things that I have Oh, and then finally, on that piece too, because we do this media training, we bring bloggers in as experts. We acknowledge their expertise and we acknowledge their contribution to the movement. So when we do our media trainings, we actually have a media panel where the people in our trainings get to talk to their favorite bloggers and people blogging on their issues about what it's like navigating the media landscape, what issues of the day they think are the most important, their ideas about what's going to be in the political debate in the next year so that people can start thinking about their own pitching and their own writing, ways that they can partner with these bloggers, and then also giving these bloggers a chance to meet the people that we're going to have available to them as sources. So just a few things that I'm going to brush the surface on because I know that Miriam's going to be able to talk more about how this actually is refined for what bloggers need because she does this every day. But 
I find that it's really important to be out there contributing to blogs as well. So not just being a passive reader, but actually reading in your cause area and commenting and interacting and engaging. Many bloggers, as well as mainstream outlet writers, really read the comment sections and, and use that to get feedback and like it when we're actively engaged. So that's a simple thing that we can do. Make it easy for bloggers to share your work. So when you do send them outreach, don't stint, tend to stick to generic press releases, the old school kind, really think about shorter pitches, clear, concise content, information in the subject line that will compel them to open it and let them know that it's worth their time and make sure to add links. Another thing too is to use your best netiquette and, and make sure to give credit as much as possible, be humble and express gratitude and recognize the people who help you put your stuff out. So Women's Media Center just had a social media award that we honored at our Women's Media Awards Gala and so we were able to invite all of the nominees and a lot of these people are bloggers who really help advance our cause and being able to recognize them in such a public way out in the media but also at an event where we were able to expose them to people that are key influencers in our movement was a really great way to recognize them for the amazing work that they do for us um, often for no compensation and also just being intentional and doing your homework it's really important when you're pitching people that they know that you understand that they're the person who's the, the right person to tell your story. It's kind of like dating. You don't want to put the cards out on the table to let them know about all the people you're looking at right away. Um, it's important <laughs> to, you know, make sure that you're letting people know that this first person you're going to, you've got this intentional exclusive for them and that they're the right message carrier and that you respect them and their expertise and their platform and the personality and tone of their specific blog and that's why they're the person to pitch this for you or to pitch this out for you and so finally if you're in a position to create spaces that are spaces where people can convene congregate share ideas and brainstorm about media strategy and your own cause strategy plan an event where you can bring the bloggers from, from your cause together to train the people that you're working with Many times people will be so open to this because they want to meet sources and they want to talk to you as well. They're passionate about these ideas just like you are. And so I wanted to leave you with one really good example of how this was well executed just to have you think about how it might work for your organizations and movements that you're working in. And that example came from Planned Parenthood. So earlier this year when all of the drama was happening around threats to Planned Parenthood and defunding Planned Parenthood and the African American, bill, the billboards uh, targeting African Americans and Latinas um, talking about, I think the, the most dangerous place for a womb is an African American child or a Latino, Latina child. Um, it was a really, really difficult time for Planned Parenthood and also other pro-choice organizations because of this really, really nasty attack. and. One of the really smart things that Planned Parenthood did is they had an African American media breakfast where they partnered with Essence Magazine, which I can tell you is a very respected magazine within the African American community, it has a long term relationship. I remember Essence being at my house since I was about four years old. I remember the branding being embedded in my head. It was like Oreo cookies or Nabisco or something like Essence is a fixture, it's on the table. And so when, so you get this automatic cred by partnering with this organization that's going to bring people in and what they did is they brought together a diverse group of bloggers who blog on women's issues as well as people of color and brought them together, fed us food and talked to us about why they needed blogger support and um, also other media support to make sure that the real story of Planned Parenthood was out there and real proactive media was being done. And when we went there, they gave us all flash drives with public relations material, pictures, everything we would need to be able to push their story out from Planned Parenthood's perspective, and then gave us access to doctors who actually are providing services, people who are in their department who are people of color who are doing this work on the front lines every day, doing media for them, and then their president took the time to address this group of journalists. And I can say that within days, there were tons of posts that I saw related to this and very positive ones for Planned Parenthood. And so I leave you with that example just to think about the possibilities in your own space of, of really being able to build those organic and authentic relationships so that you can work with bloggers to advance your cause. And thank you for your time. And if you need to reach me, my contact information is here. I look forward to getting to know each and every one of you and hearing how I can help you with your work. Thank you. Um, all right, thanks, Jimmy. That was a great um, starting place. So um, again, my name is Miriam Pettis, and I'm kind of have my blogger hat on for this.
panel, so I'm the, the sort of from the perspective of like the person that you might be trying to outreach. I'm an editor at feministing.com, which is a feminist online um, blogging community that's been around for about eight years. We are, we're a crew of about 12 people who run that site. And then I have my own blog called Radical Doula, where I write about um, politics from a, a doula's perspective. Um, and I've had that site for almost five years. So I've been in the blogging world for a pretty good amount of time, but I also do kind of do both sides of this work. I also do online communications consulting for nonprofit organizations and, and do things like helping them with their blogger outreach. So I kind of know both sides of the coin, being on the receiving end of sort of blogger outreach materials and also on the sending end. But I'm going to focus on kind of the receiving end at this point um, from that perspective. So, you know, I get, especially from feminists, because it's a, a pretty large platform, we have a pretty large audience, I get a ton of sort of like PR, blogger outreach emails every day. So I have a lot of sort of like, um, of my own personal experiences of like what gets me to open an email, what, um, what do I need to like turn that into a blog post, like what are the things that are gonna get me to engage. And so I'm just gonna kind of give you my sort of tips from my own perspective of what, um, what has been successful in terms of getting my attention and some of the things that I think might be helpful if you're trying to reach out to bloggers. Um, I mean it's, you know, to be honest like, Especially, you know, I, I do consulting work because blogging work doesn't really pay, right? Even feminist thing that has a ton of traffic and advertising revenue, it's not enough to really do more than cover our costs. So um, when I'm doing my blogging work, it's kind of like a side hustle I'm doing on top of everything else. So I'm always eager for content ideas. So I think you should approach it from the perspective of like bloggers want to want your story, right? Like they're looking for stories. Um, they're always looking for content. They're definitely looking for things that no one else is talking about that they can be kind of on the front lines. Anytime you can break news is amazing. Like Jimmy, I was talking about those billboards. You know, our highest traffic post this year um, was a post I wrote about the billboard, this sort of anti, anti-choice racist billboard in New York City. And the reason it's one of the highest traffic posts is because I got to it first and we were the, one of the first blogs to post about it. So if you have stories, especially things that are no one else is talking about, that no one else has blogged about, that you feel like you're kind of on the front lines of something that's big, um, you know, bloggers want your, want your ideas, they want your content. So don't be afraid to, to kind of be in that position of pitching, um, but you just have to do it right, right? And you have to do it um, respectfully, kind of like Jamia was talking about, and not even like about etiquette or whatever, but just like, I want emails and I want outreach that makes sense for my blog, right? Like, I, I mean, there's probably 10 emails I get every day where I open it and I spend like 45 seconds and I have no idea why this person is emailing me or what the heck they're trying to get me to do. And so like that's, you know, I actually do open every email I get pretty much. And I spend, you know, a little bit of time trying to figure out exactly what it is. And if I can't figure that out within 45 seconds of scanning the beginning of your email, then you are totally coming from left field, you know? So I want content ideas and I'm totally open. You know, I don't even have to have like an offline relationship with someone, although that obviously makes me much more likely to, to read the email and also makes it more likely that they'll actually know what I'm interested in, I think. But I don't even need to know you, but if, you, if it's clear that you don't understand my content, my blog, or why I would care about what you're writing to me about, then it's like it's gonna go nowhere except, you know, archive, right? Um, so context is really, really important. So I feel like that the subject line and then like the first two sentences of your email um, have to make it really clear exactly why this would be right content for my site and like why I would be interested in it and, and even what it is. I mean, some of these emails I'm like, I have no idea. What, like, it's, is it is it like a new movie or like a, a new band? Like, I sort of I have no idea oftentimes. Um, so that's really important for me. Email is the best way to reach me, and I think every you know blog is different, and you'll know you'll kind of have to get to know the different bloggers that you reach out to, but email definitely works best for me. Um, Twitter is pretty, can be pretty helpful in terms of just like a conversation, getting things on my radar. Um, I don't do a lot of direct message messaging with people when I'm telling people to do blogger outreach. I think it can work for some people, but not, not others. Um, but email for me is, is the like top way to get in my priority list. Um, one thing that, you know, if you're really, if you're following a, a blog really specifically, especially one that has lots of different bloggers, at Feministing, we like, if you pay a lot of attention, you can kind of tell that every day there's an editor who's sort of assigned to the site and is in charge of the site and writes half the content, and then there's a contributor who writes the other half the content. So if you're really following one outlet that has a lot of people writing for it, if you pay attention to um, like who's writing this day, like who wrote the first post of the morning today, it's a good chance that that person is going to be like on the site for that day, at least in the way we do things at Feministing. So even just paying attention to who to target, like that's one of the challenges about our platform is that um, if you don't get the email to the right person on the right day, you might miss them because I really only blog when I'm in charge of the site on a Wednesday or something. So those little eccentricities of each platform that you follow can be really helpful. 
um, you know, I will flag things that I get on a different day for, for writing about in a few days if it's not super content, like news pegged, but, um, and yeah, what Jimmy has said, you know, I get a ton, especially from nonprofits, a lot of press releases, right? Press releases are not helpful as a blogger. I don't really care about a canned quote from an executive director. I'm not going to pull that and use it in my blog. Um, I care about the issue. I care about why it's newsworthy. I care about, you know, most of the time it's just, oh, this organization. You know, I, I think one one recent story of a of a sort of blogger pitch that turned into a post was last week there was um, um, Huckabee hosted this, like, anti-choice um, forum for the Republican candidates in Iowa, and he screened some anti-choice video, and everyone was going to show up except Romney and um, Ron Paul. And I hadn't heard about that yet in any of the news that I watched. And I watched like political news pretty closely, especially stuff around reproductive rights, and we covered a lot. So it was great, you know. Um, it was, I think it was um, NARAL. Somebody from NARAL sent me an email early that morning being like, hey, this is happening. Here's a statement from NARAL. So that was perfect, and I was like, great, this is definitely a story I want to cover. Um, so that was, you know, number one, they, they knew my issue. They knew what, you know, what we might be interested in covering. It wasn't something I'd seen yet. I don't think a lot of media people covered it. Um, so that was great. It wasn't, it was like, you know, a little intro to a press release. That was good at least. It had a little bit of a personalization, like, hey, feminists, you might be interested in this. Um, you know, they attached a PDF of the statement from NARAL. PDFs aren't that helpful for me. Like, I want usually hyperlinks. Um, <laughs> and again, this is all me and my personal style, so other bloggers might be different, but I feel like some of this stuff is general generalizable. So PDFs aren't that helpful because I don't usually want, you know, when you're reading, blogger, blog readers don't usually want to click and download something, right? So if I'm going to have a hyperlink to something, I want it to be on your website. So that's uh, tip number one. So it's fine if you, want, if you want to use a regular press release, if the organization really, really likes their old school media firm and they really like press releases, whatever, it's fine. Give me a hyperlink where, where the news is on your website so that I can click through and use that as the reference to say, NARAL, you know, NARAL has a statement out about blank and just, you know, hyperlink NARAL has a statement. Um, so that's, that's a huge one. Another thing that I ended up, I think I emailed back the person from there. I was like, hey, this is great. Can you send me a link to a news story about this forum? Because I hadn't seen anything about it happening yet. And I wanted to refer to, you know, oftentimes we're referring to more mainstream media sites um, reporting about something. And so, you know, I did a little searching and couldn't find it within like 15 seconds. And so I emailed her back. So it would have been great if she had a hyperlink to, you know, a HuffPost story or something saying, oh, this is happening or, you know, and most of the reporting about it had been like a month before. Um, so, you know, those are some sort of really, really general things about what, what is really helpful when reaching out to, to bloggers. It's really the most important thing is like, why this, why this blog, you know? And I don't think you have to be, unless you're, um, unless you have a piece of content that's like a really um, big scoop, right? Like it's something that no one else has and it's really original and you want someone who's, who's gonna really like um, be like the exclusive reporter on a story. If it's really just something more general that you want to get out to a lot of people, it's fine to email a lot of people, but make sure that you know exactly why you're emailing every person because you sort of exhaust some of your relationships with them. If, if I get like spammed by someone a lot and like a lot of the emails they send me are not things that I care about or don't connect to what I write about, I'm going to stop opening their emails, right? Um, and that's, I mean, that's a sort of a side note that's frustrating about being a blogger and getting outreach to is that oftentimes people are emailing you and it's not something you can unsubscribe from, right? Like it's an individual list or they're just like keeping a list in their Gmail and they're emailing this list over and over again, right? Um, which is fine because like it's different than, you know, an organizational email list. But it's frustrating because if I, if I feel like this person's targeting me and it's not useful or helpful, like I get a lot of like, I don't know, pop culture PR stuff that I barely ever write about movies and TV and stuff and for some reason I'm on these lists. Um, it's tough because to unsubscribe, I basically have to be a jerk and be like, hey, take me off your list, you know, which is like no one really wants to do. So just thinking about these things about etiquette that you really don't want to exhaust um, how many times you email someone. Make sure that every time you do, it's really something you think they're going to be interested in. Um, and then, you know, just a couple of last things. You know, one thing that really drives me nuts, and I, this might just me being particular, is um, there's like one PR person in particular who sends every single email they send, the subject line is all caps. And it like drives me nuts. And I think it's an it's an old press release thing, right? Like press releases have all caps headlines. I'm not a newspaper reporter. I'm a blogger. I'm very like sort of online 21st century. And I feel like every time she sends me an email, she's yelling at me, being like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> and they're not yell worthy things. I don't know. That's just sort of me <laughs> me bitching because it's a side note. But I find it really frustrating. So think about things like that, you know. Um, and then I really don't like being outreached on Facebook. Facebook messages get lost really easily. 
There's that whole like two Facebook inbox thing that just came out recently. I don't like it if you write on my wall, like email me, my email's on my Facebook profile. So again, these are my personal like eccentricities as a blogger, but I do think that they, some of these lessons have kind of resonance across folks who blog. And then the last thing I'll say is um, something that's become kind of a recent trend, particularly for nonprofits, has been like blog carnivals or blogathons, where a nonprofit will try to get, or even it used to be that blogs would start these, right? Where a blog would be like, I want to host a blog carnival about this topic and get a bunch of bloggers to participate. Now it's turning into turning into kind of a PR tactic, and I've been on the other side of these, like organizing them. Um, they can be really helpful in trying to buzz up, um, like you know, generate buzz about a topic, right? Because you can try to get a bunch of blogs to all talk, write about, I don't know, um, a particular political issue on the same day, or, you know, it's Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, let's get a bunch of bloggers to write about cervical cancer. Um, but it's happening, like, all the time recently. I've been noticing that there'll be a blog carnival hosted by the same effort, like, every week, or a couple times a week, or a couple times a month. And so I just think it's, all these tactics are really important and useful, but always, um, to use them sparingly, right? Because if you start to organize like 17 blog carnivals a month, your bloggers are gonna stop wanting to participate because they're not gonna be as targeted, they're not gonna be as like picking the, the one that's like, oh, this, this is a topic that's really important in this moment right now. So just sort of like a side note about, about these different efforts and outreach that you really have to be sparing about it. It's just like your email list, right? If you, if you send an email to your list every day for three months, you're going to start getting drop off and open rates and unsubscribes. And it's the same thing with these kind of outreach tactics that we have to use them sparingly and when they're really, really appropriate and make a lot of sense. So um, I will leave it there. My contact is there, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. What time is it? 1037. 1037. Oh, I won't take my minutes. So I kind of. So in my work as a social media consultant, I work with a lot of campaigns and legislative offices. And what I'm going to talk about a little bit is kind of some of the tools you can use while you're doing the blogger outreach. Um, I am a blogger myself, but a lot about soup and cats. So let's say you have a really cute oh. cat picture that deserves a caption, or a really great soup recipe, you're not really going to ever do any outreach to me. <laughs> um, but I've done a lot of work in Netroots outreach for campaigns and, and, and legislators because it's a foreign environment to them. So the first question I have for you guys is how many of you actually belong on behalf of the organization on other blogs? That's probably, in my opinion, one of the most valuable tools is most blogs nowadays are communities in and of themselves. In the political world, the biggest example of that, of course, would be Daily Coast. But even a lot of the smaller blogs that I visit are communities. The bloggers all know each other. The commenters know each other. Sure. The lurkers may be lurking, but they have certain authors they read. <laughs> and so you develop a relationship. And so by blogging at the blog yourself as an organization or on behalf of your organization, participating in the comments in blogs that are relevant to what you're talking about is really probably the number one way to cultivate and build relationships with bloggers. Because instead of them coming to you, asking for content, instead of you doing the PR agent kind of thing and sending them content, it's happening organically. And you're getting a real relationship with these people. You're really engaging them, you're showing them that they're valuable, you're coming to them on their turf, publicly. It's not about pitching them in the blog, it's just about being a part of the community. One of the things that I always have my campaigns do is every day they log into Daily Coast and they find one diary that deals with some issue that they care about. And they read it, they wreck it, they leave some mojo, they might leave a comment or two. They're not there to promote themselves, they're there to participate in the community. After a while, it becomes second nature and they realize this is kind of fun. Nine times out of ten, the con veterans that are going out and creating their own daily post account, they don't have one. Very rarely, they don't already have one, though. Um, the other thing is, and you might want to write this one down, there's a, there's a website called gist.com, G-I-S-T. What this website does is you feed it email addresses, and it goes out and it finds all of the online presence associated with those email addresses. Now that might sound a little bit creepy, but the way it's used, or at least the way I use it, really isn't. 
So what I do is I have lists of bloggers. It can be hard to follow what bloggers are writing about in a particular week. Bloggers are kind of fickle in some ways, so maybe they have a pet concept they want to talk about or a pet candidate or whatever. But GIFs will go out and find their Twitter account, they'll find the Facebook account, they'll find all the blogs they write, and they have a really easy dashboard. So every morning when I'm doing blog outreach, I can open up the dashboard for that particular campaign or whatever, and I can see who's saying what, what are they saying, and where are they saying it. All in one place. So now instead of having to go to 50 blogs, I go to GIST, and I can pick out which ones I want to go to that day depending on what it is I'm working on or what catches my personal interest. People, P-I-P-L dot com has something a little similar. It's pretty similar. So just to put that Wait, out Wait, what is that called? People, P-I-P-L. I haven't heard of that one. I have to go evaluate that one. Thank you. I don't think it sounds as, I, I, it doesn't sound as good as the one you're using. The other thing that's nice about GIST is it allows you to attach importance to each person. <clears throat> so if there's somebody who only blogs on a topic once in a while, you might give them a 20% importance. Because you want to see what they're writing, but they're not writing enough volume that you need to see what they write every day. Or you might have someone who's a prolific writer and writes five, six, seven blog posts a day. If you're following Ministry Truth on Daily Coast, that's the way he goes. You might give them a 90 or 100% importance. And it weights them in a very transparent algorithm that you can figure out so that when you look at your dashboard, of course you're not going to see all everybody's stuff at once. But you can see it by importance. You can sort it by, you can tag every blogger for the issues that they write about. So for example, if you have you know, 20 bloggers that write about environment, 20 bloggers that write about LGBT, 20 bloggers that write about national security, and you're working particularly on national security piece, you can just click on the tag for national security and just see the bloggers that usually write about national security. And then you can look and see what they're writing about right now to see who's got the interest and is already talking about what you're talking about very easy then. Then you can email them. Then you can go on Twitter and talk to them there. The other thing that's really, really important about Blogger Outreach, and I think they both kind of hinted at this and, and said it in different ways, it's all about engagement and building that relationship. So what's the, one of the easiest things to do besides just going and reading their blogs and commenting? When they write a blog post that you like, make it a shortened link, go on to Twitter, check out this new post by Mimi, I'm sorry, yeah, Miriam, I'm sorry. There's Mimi Perez who's involved in Occupy the Boardroom. I get all confused sometimes. Um, you know, check out the new blog post by at Miriam Z. Perez with a link to the blog post. You've publicly acknowledged her writing. You've shared her writing with your audience. She notices that you've shared their writing, and when you come to her with something else, she knows who you are. It's the best way to introduce yourself to a new blogger. Find, find them on a Google alert. You have Google Alert by keywords. You might, you, that's the best way to find new bloggers, by the way, is Google Alerts for issue areas. Acknowledge them on Twitter. You're kind of introducing yourself without directly introducing yourself, but they're going to take notice. And then you start having that conversation with them. Hey, you know, I saw your post yesterday on this particular issue. That was really great. Did you see this angle to it? Or, you know, that was really cool. I just have a follow-up question. What do you think of this? Continue the conversation. Um, I just, I can't emphasize enough how much it's about relationships. And so one of the things, she gave a case study about one of the things they did. One of the case studies for what I did, um, last year during the election cycle, there were certain candidates, well, one candidate in particular, who kind of sucked all the air out of the blogosphere. Like, getting any information out there about 90% of the candidates in the blogosphere was almost impossible because these one or two candidates were all anybody ever wanted to talk about or write about. And it wasn't that they weren't great candidates, but there are 435 House races, there are 30 Senate races, and they're all important. So we formed a group called the War Dogs. And what it was, was we literally just went out and started talking to all the people we knew and said, we have identified 60 candidates that are not getting any love in the blogosphere they're running great races. Maybe they're not fundraising a lot. Maybe they have no chance in hell of winning. But they're really great candidates. We want to support them because you want to recognize the fact that they stepped up and ran. And we went out and we did a different candidate every day for two months leading up to the election. 
And some of these candidates were people nobody had ever heard of. And they were so like, wow, never knew that backstory on him. That's awesome. And we've actually now put together a group of 100 bloggers for 2012. And they've all taken on their home district, one red district that we can't possibly win, and one middle district that nobody else was, was claiming, basically. And so all 100 of these bloggers are going to go out and write about every candidate, regardless of whether they're the top tier candidates like Darcy or Alan Grayson, or the bottom tier candidate that you probably never heard of, Lance Enderley from Michigan 8, and everybody in between. Every House and Senate candidate is going to have somebody blogging about them on a regular basis the day the coast. But we took it a step further. Because of what I do, I call up a campaign, ask the cops the contractor, they'll talk to me. And now what I've done is I've ranged it so the comm director and the bloggers know each other. And the comm directors are going to be able to give those bloggers what we call VIP access, which I think is another thing that they were both talking about a little bit. You want to give bloggers return on their investment in you, give them sneak peeks, give them exclusives once in a while. We do a thing with, with I work with Congressman Rahalva, one of the things we do is we do a monthly blogger call. We invite any blogger who wants to come to join this monthly conference call. Congressman Rahalba gets on the call for 15, 20 minutes, takes a couple questions. He gets off the call, and the staffers are on the call. And it's off the record, unless they choose to be on the record, which sometimes they do. And bloggers can ask them questions about anything and everything. And sometimes these calls go five and six hours long. Bloggers want that information, that content, and now they're being given access to congressional staffers, which is not an easy thing to get. So they want to do it. When we put out the word we were doing war dogs again, I had 50 emails in the first hour after we announced it because people knew what we had done last time and they knew that they were going to get that access. Sneak peeks. One of the, one of the, one of the uh, campaigns we worked on last cycle when they made their actual official campaign announcement, when they got done with their announcement, instead of going and doing a press conference, they went into the blogger call first and they did a press conference two hours later. They gave it to the bloggers first. Recognize the bloggers are the new media. And given the media that we have in this country right now, a lot of our stories as progressives isn't going to get out there without the bloggers. <coughs> and that's sad, but true right now. Um, and I will make this offer. I make this offer every time I talk about blogging anywhere. If you ever need help connecting with political bloggers of some kind, do not be afraid to contact me. I have. Lots. I, I haven't. I, I haven't looked at my database in a couple of days, um, but I have. Last time I looked, I had well over a thousand bloggers all over the country, and I have them listed by location and issue areas that they like to write about. If they have particular candidates they prefer to write about, it's pretty targeted in terms of my my tagging of them because. I'm really conscientious about not wasting people's time. But she was saying, don't send me an email about movies. I don't freaking write about movies. That's awesome to know. And I actually take the time when I, when I find a new blogger to build that relationship and get to know them so I know what they want. Bloggers are just as busy as everybody else, if not busier, because usually they have full-time jobs in addition to their blogging. So don't waste their time. If they're writing about the environment, don't send them information about economics. They probably don't care. Or if they care, that's not something they're going to write about because that's not what their audience wants. Any of you that said in my social media talks say, I know I'd say the same thing about Twitter and Facebook stuff. Lastly, Twitter is an amazing tool for blogger outreach. It's called the Bake Shop. Uh, you, you heard me talk about this yesterday. Bloggers are often followed by people that are really influential. Because bloggers, everyone, everyone in the media, everyone who's in the know and respected has come to realize that bloggers, they dig, they get these stories. They, a lot of times, a lot of big stories get broken by bloggers by anybody, before anybody else. So sometimes when you want to go to somebody in the media who's really influential, it's really hard to get their attention. They're getting thousands and thousands of pictures a day on, you know, crazy stories. But if you go, say, on Twitter, and you look at who they're following, you can identify the bloggers they're following. And then you look at that blogger and you see what they're writing about. 
we, we, I was telling the story yesterday, we were able to place a story with Olbermann this way. We had a really niche kind of story, but we knew Olbermann was kind of dancing around it with some of his previous reports. And so we went and found a blogger that was writing about this kind of stuff that Olbermann was following. And we went out, we spent three days just talking to the blogger, getting to know them a little bit on Twitter. And finally, we sent the blogger a link and said, saw you wrote about this last week, you might be interested in following up with this. He retweeted that tweet, which Olbermann then retweeted, and he wrote the story, which Olbermann then tweeted the story. Then Olbermann called and had that candidate on the air that night because he realized that it really was a big story. So we call that the make shot. And it's kind of a useful thing because now this blogger totally, totally loves us <laughs> because he broke a story on his blog that got picked up by Olbermann. But he couldn't have done it if we hadn't found him to give it to him. So never be afraid to think out of the box and think creatively. I know one guy uh, who shall remain nameless, he's not in this room, but he's in the building somewhere, I'm sure, um, who was recording a blogger who wrote about the issues he cared about and that he was working on and couldn't get this blogger to write for him to save his freaking life. So finally he went out of his way and found out where the blogger worked because he knew people who knew the blogger and he sent the blogger a dozen balloons. And in each balloon was a little piece of paper with links <laughs> written on them that would take him to the content that he wanted to push at the guy. Well, the guy was just so impressed with the creativity that he actually finally went out and broke the story after two months. <laughs> <laughs> I would feel stopped, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, there, there are lines dropped, but it was kind of one of those things well. where people knew each other, and it kind of became like a, like a friendly <laughs> jousting kind of thing. You know, so yeah, obviously with a complete stranger you want to do something like that, but you know, you build a relationship with bloggers, you know what's going to get, get to them. You know what kind of access is going to get to them. Always, always, always credit. I mean, I don't think any, I don't think I even have to say that. I mean, nobody in this room is stupid, but sometimes the basics get forgotten. So I'm going to shut up. In about 10 minutes. Let's take questions. Hey, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Michael Bolden. You know me from Daily Coasters at BMYC. That is, oh. Me, so. Okay. See? Um, I knew I'm I the him. managing editor of the Daily Gotham, one of the first progressive bloggers in the state of New York, so that's my background. One of the things that I do also is run the New York State Progressive Blogger List. Bring <laughs> uh, <laughs> bloggers for your cause. That was thrown back at me a couple of days ago when we put it up on the Netflix New York site. I said, Mike, what the fuck are you doing? Hurting us? No, 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 we can't be hurting. <laughs> I don't know where that title um, came from. Yeah, I, I and Can't say it, I it either. I think it was a quote from a conversation, actually, where about a year and a half ago, a bunch of us were sitting in a bar at Nevers Nation uh. talking, and they were asking me about the Wardons thing. I said, yeah, hurting, hurting bloggers is like hurting, hurting booties. You can't do it. Hurting cats on meth. You know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's, it's, if anyone in here is from an organization who has the idea that you can hurt us, you know, that's not okay, of course. No, no. Just everything that you said, you know, build these personal relationships. Take our calls. Take us out for a drink. You know, a lot of us like that. And a lot, <laughs> you know, and a lot of bloggers really don't have a lot of money because we throw a lot of time and effort and resources into doing what we love. You know, and you write great stuff in daily Coast. Thank you. What do you deliver so long? Um, no, but again, build that relationship and make it. You know, put yourself in our shoes. You know, do do the due diligence. You know, find out what we like. You know, we love our little foibles and quibbles. So you, know, you are us. I'll give you just another quick example of case study. They, SEIU did this big thing in DC two weeks ago where they flew all the bloggers in for, for they, they flew in all these people for take back the capital. And uh, at the last minute, they got someone to give them a budget and they flew in bloggers from all over the country to participate in this effort. And some of those bloggers were people I knew. And we went out, like the last night they were in town, we all went out for dinner. And one of them was telling me how amazing it was because she actually kind of became an overnight YouTube star because she was following the crowd that was going to speak to the person who was her representative. And he locked the door on them. And so she went and started pounding on the door, let me in, I'm a constituent. 
And like the staff was so rude and the congressman came out and said something like, you know, oh, you want to blog about something? But like donated toys to Toys R Us or something, you know, to the Toys for Tuts, 700 toys or whatever, Merry Christmas, and walked away. And she's like, you know what? I'm your constituent, I want to talk to you. Like over and over and over again. And the video actually got played on that app. Um, and she was just there as a blogger, but they took the time to fly her in to cover this event. And then when this happened, they made it about her with her permission, of course, because she helped push the story. And then her senators saw that and called SEIU and said, I want to sit down and talk to that blogger. She ended up getting a half hour with her senator, which was not ever anything that was anticipated or planned. So look at what's going on in your world of your organization. See what's happening. See how you can just do something. Go that extra mile. If you see, one of the things I like to do is when I see that a, a blogger is writing about a particular race, I'll send them a note and say, are you actually talking to the campaign? Very often they'll say, I, they don't return my calls. I call the campaign and say, you know, this guy's really spending a lot of time writing about you. You should really give the guy a call. And they're like, oh. And a lot of times it's just the contracts are just so busy, if they don't know who the person is that's calling them, they don't return the call because they're just... Legislative staff, campaign staff, it's not a joke when they say they work 100 hours a week and they're underpaid. So just sometimes you just need extra help from the outside to help give that nudge. Um, when you're reaching out to somebody um, and you have something <coughs> that uh, is, a, is a story, um, but the blogger doesn't really know you and you want to give it to them as an exclusive, um, how long do you wait before then? You meet somebody else? Yeah. Mm. You should let them know. I mean, one of the things that we do is when we're pitching anyone, bloggers or you know, traditional media outlets, is say to them, you're the person that we want to give this to, but if I don't hear back from you in this amount of time, I'll, I look forward to hearing from you, but if I don't hear back from you from this amount of time, I'll assume that maybe you're going to pass on it. Mm -hmm. And people, if that's just said respectfully, usually respond and let you know and are okay with that. But I think the first part is just an initial query. So maybe you put it out there and don't give them the deadline, and then you don't hear back in a reasonable amount of time, and then you do the next thing saying, hey, just like following up on my previous email, and then if I don't hear back from you this time, then I'll assume that you're going to pass on it, and then I'll go and place it elsewhere. And I think that's fine, just being upfront with people about that. I think the other thing is tell them why it is you want them to have the exclusive. I saw that you've been writing about the uranium mine issue with Grand Canyon. You've been doing a really great job of covering it. And I have this really exclusive interview that I can offer you about it that I think would help broaden your story. And so I'm giving it to you first because you've already done the homework. Honestly, flattery. And they're huge. Bloggers are human. Treat them like humans, treat them with respect, flatter them. I've honestly, I've never had a blogger not take my pitch because I go out of my way to treat them with respect. And most bloggers that I approach already know me in some way. If the very least, I call them up and say, hi, my name is Beth, you don't know my name is Beth, you probably know me as Speedway Babs over on Coats, I'm the one that does the soups and, and cats, and they go, oh. I mean, I've literally had people freak out at every station because I'm the lady that writes about soup. And it's like, really? Because I'm standing right next to Marcos. And he is the, he's the rock star. Freak out about him, not me. Um, just treat them like human beings. And like he said, take them out for a dream. Call them up once in a while just to call them up. Hey, how's it going? Oh, no, I'm not pitching anything today. I just want to see how you are. And we haven't talked in a while. That's real relationship building. And um pick up the phone three days before an election about a candidate that I haven't heard about and ask me to write, figure out everything that this candidate is about and then put it on the front page of Daily Coast. That is just a complete misunderstanding of what me personally or a lot of people in this room are capable of doing. So, right. It's, it's, uh, don't be lazy, in other words. So. Any other questions? About out of time. Um, Beth, regarding the, the, the conference call, you, did you just set this up like uh, with all your, you know, legislators, senators, Congress people? Yeah, I, I every, admit, words, every week or every month is it? We do it once a month. Uh -huh. um, we do a progressive caucus blogger call once a quarter with Ellison and Grohalva both on the call. Uh -huh. 
Um, and I'm, I'll admit, I'm going to tell you a little secret about campaigns and, and legislative offices. If you want to schedule something with them or with staffers, call and ask for the scheduler. The schedulers in the caucus offices love me because when I want to do live blogs with the members or I want to do blogger calls with the members, I don't go to the comm director first, I go to the scheduler first. And I call and say, hey Anna, when could RG do a blogger call this week? And she gives me two or three times. And then I go to the comm director and say, so I spoke to Anna and she says five o'clock on Wednesday is good, so let's do it five o'clock on Wednesday. And he'll be like, uh, okay. Because he knows that if I've already cleared with the scheduler, there's no excuse not to do it. Um, the schedulers are the gatekeepers. Is there any time that that you've heard of <clears throat> that they wouldn't, or the, the congressman was like just too busy and that they said, um, or their schedule. During, during the deficit debate, mm -hmm. the debt ceiling debate, there was like that 72 hours where things were just insane, right. and we actually had to cancel right. a blogger call that had been scheduled weeks in advance. Um, but it's very, very rare. Mm -hmm. Rule of thumb, depend, look, remember who your audience is. If you're doing a blogger call, with somebody who's on the East Coast, but their constituency is on the West Coast, don't do it at five o'clock Eastern time when everyone's still at work at three o'clock in California. We always try to do our calls at eight, nine o'clock Eastern time to try and account for people on the West Coast when necessary. But we don't want to go much later than that because we don't want people on the East Coast to have to stay up late. We do sometimes do them during lunch hours and we kind of rotate around. Sometimes it's lunch hour in the Midwest, sometimes it's lunch hour on the East Coast. West Coast to try and give everybody a chance to participate. We rotate it around. What if by chance the commerce person says, I'm sorry, I don't want to, but I mean, is there a way of maybe putting a little pressure or just maybe call writing me. or? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I've never had a member of Congress tell me they wouldn't do a lot of call. No, huh? But okay. I think a lot of it's just because they know me. Okay. And so they trust me, and they know that the bloggers I invite onto that call aren't going to be asking gotcha questions. They're not out to get them. Yeah. And they're not going to be their screen. Like, I don't just open it up and put the phone number out in public okay. so that any right wing troll can come and do it. Okay. But I, like I said, I have a ton of bloggers in my database, and so they get personalized invitations. A lot of times I'll call people up and go, hey, RL. We're doing a call with Grijalva on uranium mine in, 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 you know, in Arizona. You are in this district, but you might want to be on this call. Um, and again, it's just because I know what they write about, I can give them that kind of personal touch and tell them why it is they want to be there. What are they going to get out of it? Right. Besides just being able to say they want to call with a member of Congress. Right. But the other thing is, I mean, SEIU thing, uh -huh. they ended up getting, the president of SEIU was in DC that week. Mary was in there, but Mary Kay was there. And so they arranged for five of the bloggers to sit down with Mary Kay for an hour one afternoon, which is, again, one of those exclusive kind of things. Give them that extra carrot. Make yourself available. If they have questions, maybe sometimes they have a story they want to come to you for a quote. Try to pin the quote. And if you can't, at least off the record, tell them why you can't. We're not going to comment on that, but off the record, because I trust you and I know you, this is what the deal is. But on the record, we can't comment. I've never had a blogger violate that trust because they know if they do, they're done. They're not going to get the access anymore. We're, we're out done. of time, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, thank you. Thank you.